Please turn in your Bibles then again to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. The dominant focus this evening will be applications drawn from verses 15 to 22. So follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read Exodus 2, beginning at verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water the father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses was willing to dwell with the man and gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Well, let us once again seek God's face as we come to his word this evening. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, as we bow in your presence, we have been reminded through the singing of these hymns that a day is coming when all that we see around us will be radically altered. The Lord Jesus Christ will return with a shout, and we will have the glorious privilege of being taken up with him and having this whole universe renovated, a new heavens and a new earth, in which we will dwell perfectly righteous, perfectly righteous spirits, deathless bodies to serve them. Lord, what a glorious day it will be. We plead with you, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But in t- in, as we anticipate and wait for that day, we plead with you that you would help us to cling to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would help us to govern our lives by your holy word that you've given to us. Help us to strive to be all that we ought to be and to seek to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ to others that they might be ready for that last day. So help us, Lord, even now as we study your word, to prepare for the day when Christ will return. And we ask that you would do this to get glory to yourself. And in, your, in Jesus' name alone we pray. Amen. Amen. By way of review, and for those who were not here, we began last week a study of the life of Moses beginning with Exodus chapter 1. Moses is writing this book and its autobiographical material that we're looking at at this point. Moses set the stage for his coming uh, on the scene to help the people of Israel. In chapter 1, he described how dark a time it was when oppression and slavery were bounded there in Egypt and Israel was there under that oppression. And that set the stage for Moses to be born and to be shaped and to come and deliver the people of Israel. And so we're seeing God raising up a redeemer. In verses 1 and 2, we have the record of the birth of of Moses. God sends his servant. In verses 3 through 10, we saw how God saved his servant from death, for Pharaoh had given a law that all Egyptians were to take any male that was born to the Israelites and cast him into the Nile River. And we saw that the mother saved her son in faith, hiding him for three months, and the father as well. And that the, then she put him in an ark. This daughter of Pharaoh came along. She was an instrument of saving him from destruction, took him to be her own, 
After a time, after, she, after he had stayed with his mother and was uh, cared for by his mother, and even his sister, Moses' sister Miriam, was an instrument in God's hands to save little Moses, for she was the one who approached uh, the, the Pharaoh's daughter and asked if she could get a wet nurse to take care of the baby for the princess. Then we saw how God shapes his servant. And we saw that in several ways. Uh, and that's what we'll be looking at tonight, applications drawn from the way God shapes his servant. And so I'll move on then into the last part in verses 23 to 25, the description of the fact that Moses is God's servant. God is, after all, actually still working. He is very concerned about his people in their bondage. And so he is determined desirous in keeping his promises to deliver them from that bondage. As we come now to uh, just basically all application this evening, I have one major application and I want to break it down in three ways. As we think of Moses and the way God raised him up and the way God shaped him to fulfill his role as lawgiver, judge, mediator, deliverer of his people, this passage gives us an example of how God develops his servants. And so we can learn principles for what we can expect God to do in us as he is shaping and developing us. Now we are all, in one sense, God's servants. All of God's people are his servants. And yet there is a peculiar sense in which those who have been given specific responsibilities by God are especially his servants, whether that be parents who have the role of being ser his servants in leading and directing their homes, or whether that is a pastor or a deacon or a boss in the particular role that God has given you to, and called you to to serve him. And so there are peculiar applications. I found a good deal of profit for my own soul in directing me. But I hope and trust as well that it will be beneficial for you as we look at how God develops his servants. And the first thing that I want you to note from this passage, and we'll look at several other passages where this is the case, is that God develops his servants often through faith, faithful nurturing homes through faithful nurturing homes Moses was reared in his home for three months then he was taken away for a brief time there at the river and given back to his mom for at least three years and possibly as much as 12 years until he was weaned at which time he was given up to go to the house of Pharaoh or house of Pharaoh's daughter. During that time, there was nurturing going on. There was the care and the love and the instruction that, was, that came from his parents to, to Moses. There was nurturing, it even says, when he went to Pharaoh's house. And it read, we read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, how she, the daughter of Pharaoh, nurtured him. She took care of him. This is a womb, if you will, in which God often gives birth to his choice servants. It is a primary means that God uses to develop, to instruct, to shape his people. Now, some of us are first generation Christians. Some of you have grown up in homes where you had ungodly parents, ungodly grandparents. And as far as you know, there's never been a Christian in your life until God brought somebody outside of your home into your life, and God was pleased to lay hold of you and save you. And you began, as it were, that household of faith. Some of us, on the other hand, have had the privilege of growing up under the nurture of Christian parents, Christian grandparents, and if I had known them for me, Christian great-grandparents. That is one of the normal ways that God uses to shape his servants. 
And we see it here with Moses. This nurturing environment, this incubator, this womb for giving birth to his servant. Now, I would have you notice, especially with regard to Moses, it could also be said with regard to Daniel, that though mom had only at most 12 years with Moses, he was able to withstand 37 or 28 to 37 years in the public school system in Egypt because of the nurturing that he had received at home on mom and dad's knee. At most 12 years, possibly only three years, in which case he spent 37 years in Pharaoh's house learning all the wisdom and much of that wisdom, utter folly of Egypt. And yet he was able to withstand that. He had the discernment to be able to sift through that. Now that's a God-given gift. That's a God-imparted grace. But one of the means that he uses is the careful nurturing of faithful parents to see that come to pass. Some of you will recall when we started back in 1 Samuel, the life of David, and we studied the the family life of Samuel, his parents, Elkanah and Hannah, and how Hannah showed herself to be a woman of deep faith. And what's the one thing we saw Hannah doing more often than anything else? Praying. Praying for a son praying about her son, praising God for the son that God had given her. And what do we hear from Samuel later in life? May it never be that I should sin by ceasing to pray for you. He was a man of prayer. Where did he learn that? Yes, God by His grace made him a man of prayer. But I think that the roots of that go clear back to the home in which he was nurtured, in which he saw and was prayed for by his mother. And very likely by his father, who also was a pious, godly man. Turn with me to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. Here's a situation where a life, a family life is is very disrupted. Esther's parents are not around. I don't know. We don't know if they're dead. We don't know if they're still back in Jerusalem or back in Israel somewhere. But she is there and Mordecai, her cousin or uncle, is taking care of her. Esther chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Esther chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. And he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face, and when her father or her mother died, we do know where they are, they were dead, sorry about that, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to Susa the capital unto the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and food, gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Here's a woman in a very, very difficult situation. She is a Jewess. She is an Israelite. She has been taken into the harem of a godless pagan king. She is being considered for a wife for him. This is not an easy situation for her to be in. It's not something that mom and dad could have said, well, if someday the king should ask you to marry you, this is how you ought to act. But Mordecai had spent time training up, rearing Esther in his home. 
And so when Esther comes to this time, she has her cousins or uncle's words ringing in her ear, in her head, saying, don't tell anyone that you're a Jew. Don't tell anyone you're from Israel. And this was pressed upon her again. Later in chapter 2, Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people. Why? Even as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. He had spent time nurturing. He had spent time directing. He had spent time instructing. And she trusted his wisdom. And she continued to follow his lead. And so when we come to chapter 4, which is the greatest test for Esther, when the decree has gone out for all the Jews to be killed, and Esther's there in the palace, there's a sense in which she's in a protected place. She finds out that this has happened, that this decree is out there. She has this interaction with Mordecai in Esther chapter 4 and verse 12, where Mordecai tells her, Do not imagine that the king's palace can escape, that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And listen to this woman's response. Such a godly response from somebody who was probably not very old. She replies to Mordecai, Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. And that probably means as well, pray for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Why? Because she had learned to listen to Mordecai in his home. And the training in that home had produced a young woman who could withstand the temptations of the pagan palace of the Persians. This young servant was able to withstand the temptations and act in a godly way. And the womb where she was birthed was a faithful, godly, nurturing home. Think in the New Testament with me of one other example. A young man named Timothy. It is said of Timothy that he had a sincere faith. But that sincere faith was a faith that his grandmother Lois had and his mother Eunice had and that it has brought down to him. We read in Paul's letter to Timothy that he is to continue in the things that he has become convinced of, knowing from whom he's learned them. And that from childhood he has known the sacred writings which were able to make him wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. From childhood, early days, he was being taught the scriptures at home. Our sister Nancy Klingner is facing some very sad days, so she she rejoices that her mother is in heaven. She faces the difficulty and the grief of being separated from one she loves. Yet she said to me in the parking lot this morning when we had a brief conversation, she said, I had a great mother. She taught me the scriptures from my childhood. This is the kind of womb, brethren, that servants of God, from which servants of God are birthed. Many of us may never be great spokesmen for God. Many of us may never do great things for God. We may not achieve any great status in society. We may not achieve any great uh, practice or or experiment that we do some great thing for our nation. 
but maybe our children or our grandchildren might. Many a great man was born into a very obscure home. But in those obscure homes, often they were taught the scriptures from their childhood. Often they heard the truth. And so a man like Timothy could be raised up and have a testimony in all of the cities around so that when Paul saw him, he said, I want this young man to go with me. And later could say of him, I have none like-minded like Timothy who loves and seeks the things of Christ and not his own interests. Where does that kind of faith come from? Yes, the grace of God working in somebody through the various means of grace. And God can raise those people up out of the most pagan pools of cess- the cesspools of sin if He cho- so chooses to do so. But oftentimes, they come out of homes where the truths have been taught from mommy's breast and from daddy's knee. Brethren, you who are Christian parents, I ask you, are you training your children in the faith? Are you availing yourselves of the means for training your children in the faith? Things like Christian education, as we heard about last week. Sunday school where teachers labor and pray to train your children at a level that is commensurate with them, giving them the basics to build them up, to help support the things that you're giving to them. Are you availing yourself of the books that you can use for family devotions? Are you making that time to be able to sit down with your children, both on those extraordinary times when they need mom or dad to sit and talk through an issue with them? Or the normal times where they're regularly going to be sitting down hearing something from God's Word opened up to them. And I'm not talking about just a little two-minute devotional read from a little paperback but something where you're thinking through what do they need and seeking to impart truth to them. Is your home a nurturing environment where such children will listen to you and hear you and respond to you? This is what God calls parents to do. This is one of the primary duties that we have, is to train up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, there's been a lot of, that, a lot of instruction given on using the discipline part because we can be very lax in that. But we also need the instruction part of knowing how to get into a little head and pull the threads of what's going on in that thinking process. What are they thinking when they do that? And sitting down and trying to figure it out. And it only gets more and more necessary the older they get. But if they have not been nurtured from mom's lap, when they get to be teenagers, it's a whole lot harder to talk to them. Remember what the Lord God said was at the heart of family life under the Old Covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 6? It was parents keeping the statutes and the commandments and teaching them to their sons and their grandsons that they might fear the Lord their God, giving them the Shema, Shema, giving them the heart of Old Covenant religion. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And that foundational commandment Under the old covenant, which comes over into the new, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. 
And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk in the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, there are people that take that and they make all kinds of fancy little practices out of them. It's just this easy, brethren. It's talking about it and bringing the, the Word of God to bear all the time. It's praying in every circumstance. It's seeking to know something about, well, I believe God has something to say about this and bringing that to bear on this decision, that decision, this part of life, that part of life. Whether you're walking, sitting, or in our case, writing. It's taking those times to impart to our children the faith, the propositional truths that they need in order to sift through the error of this world. And then I would add before I leave this first point, are you exemplifying a faithful life before your children? Are you exemplifying what you're trying to impart to them? Do they see somebody who loves the truth and therefore wants to impart it? Who, like Ezra, first studies to apply it and do it and then speaks it? Now, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect before you can talk. Because if that were the case, no generation would ever hear the truth. It would stop. Right? But the fact of the matter is that's what they need to see. Oh, mom is living these things. Dad is living these things. This isn't just a duty they've got to kind of sit up there and check off their list. Oh, they did dad thing today. They had family devotions. No, I see him talking to mom about the things of God. I see him interacting with the Word of God in his own life. I hear him talking to the people at church about the Word of God. And so when he sits down, I know he loves this book. He loves this God and he wants me to know that book and love that God. Do you have a life which is marked by trusting in the Lord with all your heart and not leaning on your own understanding? Do you have a life that is consciously marked by acknowledging the Lord in all your ways? Or are you constantly anxious? Or are you constantly fearful? Are you regularly cutting corners on things which God requires of you, which make this book seem rather malleable, like silly putty? Just kind of push that piece over. We don't want to do that today. Do you make use of all the public means and private means of grace? Here's how God makes servants. Very often through faithful, nurturing homes. But second, God makes servants through many, through, excuse me, through any number of pleasant or unpleasant or difficult providences. He shapes his servants through any number of pleasant or unpleasant or difficult provident, provinces, providences. We saw that in the life of Moses. We saw him being shaped to be a political leader, a judge, a lawgiver, and a mediator. Now, Amram and Jochebed didn't look at him and say, Wow, he has a beautiful face. I see a leader. I see somebody who can lead two million people out into the wilderness. So we need to figure a plan and get together a curriculum so that he can get all the skills to be able to lead people. You know what? He's probably going to be interacting with international leaders like maybe the Pharaoh. So maybe we better teach him about court life. And we better teach him about Egyptian law. They had no idea that he was going to need those kinds of things. Now I don't doubt that they prayed, God, direct us so that we can impart to him what he needs. And I think their primary focus was imparting to him the faith. 
But God said, listen, I'm going to orchestrate all that. So the daughter of Pharaoh takes him and brings him into the house of Pharaoh, and he learns all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians. And it says, Stephen says, he learned it. One commentator said, this is the first spoils taken from Egypt. He got a hold of the wisdom and knowledge necessary to be able to understand something of the world. Remember, it was was a magnificent culture in terms of mathematics and science and other things that they had grasped. There's still questions as to how they built those pyramids. Amazing culture and giftedness in that culture. Now there was amazing folly too. The plenitude of gods that they had that were just absolutely ridiculous. And he was able to sort through that. But he was able to learn and to master these things because God knew he was going to need that. And he became a man of power in words and deeds. You see, his words in the next chapter about having a lead tongue and not being able to talk, they don't hold water. All the training he had, he knew how to talk. He had the wisdom to be able to do it. He just wasn't ready to do it, wasn't going to do it. We'll come to that later. But he was taught in the Egyptian court. He saw the courtiers courtiers, and how they worked together. He probably saw other people coming in to, to the Egyptian uh, palace there and recognized how somebody should speak to this person and how they should approach the Pharaoh. Josephus writes or wrote that that Moses was actually commissioned as a general. And in the Egyptian army, he he led a good part of the army against the Ethiopians and distinguished himself with many victories and taking cities. And Josephus gives a, a nice history of that. I don't know if that's true or not. It may have just grown out of out of myth. It may have grown out of Just idea reading Stephen's words that he was a man of power in words and deeds and, and this somehow built up around that. But the fact of the matter was that you could build a story like that because that's the kind of person Moses was. He was well prepared. He was prepared to be a protector and provider. That's what he was going to have to do with these people when he took them out of Egypt, lead them through the desert. He's going to have to provide for them. He's going to have to lead and protect them. And he learned how to do that, going off and protecting these seven women who had their sheep there at the well in Midian. He's beginning to act like a protector and and practicing some of those roles. The word helped in that verse in Exodus 2.17 literally translated as the word saved. He saved them. He delivered them. He was a deliverer. That was his job. In Psalm 77 and verse 20 we read that God led his people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So Moses was a shepherd. He's viewed as a shepherd over God's people. Oh, where did he learn how to be a shepherd? Well, he spent some time out in the wilderness in Midian, pasturing pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness. Exodus 3 in verse 1. So he learned how to handle sheep. He says, you know, I'm going to think there's some things in this that I'm going to be able to use to lead people. He didn't sit down and say, you know, I'm going to need to learn how to lead people. You know, I think maybe being a shepherd would be the thing I ought to do. God was orchestrating this. In his providence, God was orchestrating all of these things in a good way to prepare him to be the man he was going to be. And so for 40 years, he's out in Midian shepherding. Now, why is he out in Midian shepherding? Because he blew it. Because he killed somebody. And he had to run away. And we can admire his zeal and his determination to be the leader he needed to be, but he wasn't ready yet. And so God says, I'm going to use your sin. I'm going to take you out there for a time so that you can be out there and learn. The people need 40 years and you need 40 years before this deliverance is going to take place. It would seem at the very least that 
God knew that the present king, the present Pharaoh, needed to die because he dies at the end of chapter 2. The people needed to ripen under the sun of oppression. As one man put it, he said, the children of Israel are to learn by the continuance and probably increased severity of their bondage the value of their deliverance and be the more ready to appreciate the goodness of God and the efforts of Moses in effecting it. They weren't ready yet. And so when Moses came to them, they had no idea that they were looking at a deliverer. They didn't understand him, completely misunderstood what he was doing when he sought to avenge this one who was beating an Israelite. William Taylor says in his description of this time, Moses had not yet acquired sufficient command of himself. And they had not as yet been stung into mutiny by their oppression, that is the people of Israel. So he was sent to the wilderness to learn to rule his own spirit. And they were sent back to the brickyards to smart, to hurt, for 40 years longer beneath the taskmaster's rods. There is, there is thus a long distance often between the formation of a purpose and the right opportunity for its execution. And we should always regard doing things in God's time as why. Whatever God's timing is. Now Moses could have been saying, I'm out here 40 years with sheep. I wanted to be back there leading those people out through the wilderness and get them out of the oppression. Why am I wasting time? And he may actually have thought that at times. I wouldn't put it past him. We're, you know, he's a man like the rest of us. And he may have been out there grumbling at times. What am I doing? But God knew what he was doing. God was building in him the self-control he was going to need because you recall he's a man with a pretty violent temper when he wants to be. And it got him into trouble even as it was. What would it have done if he'd never mastered it for those 40 years? People weren't ready. Moses wasn't ready. Egypt wasn't ready. But when it was time, God sent him back. And we see this in other servants of God as well. We see it in the life of Paul. What a wonderful providence that he studied under Gamaliel there in Jerusalem, while at the same time he grew up in Tarsus. And so he had a Jewish nationality and knew the scriptures, but he also had Roman citizenship. Who would have thought he was going to need to use his Roman citizenship? Well, God thought. And so God prepared his servant. He spent a number of years in Arabia before he actually got involved in his ministry. At least in one place I read, there was pro it was probably a month, as much as eight years in Arabia. Eight years for the most gifted man the church has ever known in terms of theology. And yet God says, eight years, you've got to be in Arabia for a time. And so he's off in Arabia. Suffered many trials which could have been viewed as problematic and slowing him down. You know, the, if you've ever heard the picture of him, he was, he was supposedly bow-legged and, and hump-shouldered. And that may actually be because of the whippings and the rods that he received. Those are some of the, the symptoms from, those kinds of treat, from that kind of treatment. But those were the things that though they slowed him down, that God was using to validate he is a servant of Jesus Christ. As Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Excuse me, it should have been 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. Where Paul's giving his long list of of all of the difficulties that he has faced in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. And how does he know? How do they know? In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times received. And he goes through that long list of all the things which he suffered. Those were the validation that he was God's servant. Now, brethren, as we think of our lives and the various providences, whether positive providences or negative providences, 
let's put it this way, pleasant providences or unpleasant providences? Because they're all positive. And that's the point. God doesn't waste time. God doesn't waste His time. He's orchestrating everything to develop the character and skills you need to accomplish the purposes He has set apart for you. One of the commentators told about a, a man that was uh, in college, was a, was a baseball player, and, and he, was, he was headed to the majors. And right as he finished his, his final year in college, he hurt his elbow. And he never made it in the majors. And his friend went through a very dark time after that. And he really wrestled with, why, God, did you allow this to happen? And eventually, he came through that dark time. And, and the man writing the commentator says, I wish I could tell you that his, his arm then got better and he was miraculously able to pitch 90 mile an hour, 94 mile an hour fastballs and curveballs and all those other things that they throw. He said, but he didn't have that. He never got his arm back. But he became a faithful husband and a faithful father and a good, solid Christian. And God used that dark time to help develop him into the man that he was supposed to be. So when you have that temporary job that you have to take to make ends meet, you don't know when you're going to need those skills sometime in the future. When you have that class that you're required to take outside of your major for some college degree, which is just an absolute waste of time, it's not a waste of time. God's trying to teach you something. Maybe he's trying to teach you a little patience to sit and listen and get through something that's not so pleasant. The unreasonable boss for whom you've worked or the teacher for whom you have to write a paper and take some unreasonable test. You know, not all teachers are going to like you. Not all the people in the world are going to like you. And you have to learn to take that and say, okay, Lord, you're teaching me something about myself, about how to bear up and forbear. How about that unpleasant responsibility you had to perform at home or on the job? Oh, yuck, why did I have to do that? You're learning things. You're learning character. You're learning skills. You don't know what things God is teaching you and what things He's putting together to make you the person, the servant, that you need to be later on in life. Remember Pastor Blaze telling us about how God made him into a servant of Christ. Remember the donkey's work he had to do, shoveling coal, to show himself a faithful man? When I was in college and I got out of, about to get out of college, I was told the story about some men that went to, to an interview at IBM. IBM was booming back then, and so they had 200 men that they brought in for this interview, and the first thing they did is they served them dinner. That was the boom years, and so they had a lot of people to choose from, and so the first thing they did, anybody who salted or peppered their food before they tasted it, they eliminated them. Wow. Because they didn't want people who, didn't, who did things without thinking. And that was their test that they had come up with. Who knew that getting down one way and slurping water or getting down another way and drinking water was going to make a difference as to whether you got in the army or didn't? We don't know what little things God's using to prepare us or to place us where He wants us. That illness or injury that set you aside for a time. That providence which caused delays in your plans. Listen again to William Taylor. The ripening of a purpose is not always the mark of the presence of an opportunity. A man's or woman's first battle is with himself or herself. And only when he or she has conquered on that field is he or she competent to lead others in their warfare. And God has all kinds of other purposes for setting us aside or putting us in a place where we're not doing what our purpose is. Whether God's providence has you suffering under an Egyptian taskmaster's lash, lounging in an Egyptian palace, or chasing sheep around the wilderness, it's a providence designed to shape you into the man or woman God wants you to be. It's what God was doing with Moses. God teaches us through pleasant and unpleasant 
providences. God also shapes his servants through failures. Through failures. And James Montgomery Boyce here had three helpful lessons. He says there are three things, at least, which God teaches us through our failures. Failures that may be due to sin or failures that may be due to weakness. In Moses' case, it was failure due to sin. And God actually used his failure due to sin to put him where he wanted him in order to shape him into the man he wanted him to be. Moses ran before he should have. And Moses let his passions get the most of him so that in a moment, he, in an unguarded moment, he gave vent to his vengeance and his own personal justice and in his sense, in his way, derailed him. <coughs> Excuse me. I love allergies. <coughs> derailed him from his purpose, took him out of his activities because he had killed a man and now had to flee for his life. Here are the lessons, then, that James Montgomery Boyce draws from our failures. No matter how talented we are or may think ourselves to be, no matter how many resources we may have, without Christ, we can do nothing. Now that sounds pretty basic, right? John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. There's a lot of times we don't like to admit that. Or if we do admit it, we do what Professor, or excuse me, uh, Pastor Boyce says, we, do, we say it this way, well, apart from Christ, I can't do much. But that's not what he said. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. S failure, sometimes miserable failure, has a way of knocking the pride out of us. Far better to cultivate the grace of true humility than to challenge God with your proud life to knock it out of you. There's a reason to stop being proud. Because God has a lot of ways to knock every peg you're standing on, standing on right out from underneath you and leave you flat on your face. Believe me, I know. When I came to Trinity Baptist Church 22 years ago, I thought I was something. At least in the little church that I had come from, I was about the only one who knew what Calvin actually said. Who'd ever read anything about Calvin. And so I came in here and I thought, oh, I'm going I'm to you know, really take the world by storm. And I sat down in the pews and I had people sitting around me, mothers and daughters and, or mothers and, and, and husbands and other people. just, just sit, And they had more theology in their pinky than I had in my puffed head. And so the first thing I did is I put my foot in my mouth three or four hundred times until God knocked me down and said, just shut up and listen. You don't know nothing. And God has a way of humbling us. So far better, you younger men, far better each one of us to clothe ourselves with humility because God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. So when you fail, see what God's trying to knock out of you and look for the pride that he may just be trying to to deal with in your own life. Second lesson, we are capable of terrible things if we persist in our way instead of proceeding in his way. We are capable of terrible things if we persist in our way instead of proceeding in his way. That's what Moses did. Who would have thought that this beautiful baby would grow up and kill somebody? And so I need to be, we need to be, brethren, you need to be constantly submitting your ideas and plans to God and His will, awaiting His timing, staying within His framework. God is using our failures to take us to the desert to tend sheep in order to teach us that we need what we need for the next step in our lives. And so He's trying to keep us from taking missteps. So if we fail, then we find ourselves over here He's trying to teach us 
He's trying to help us. If we're not submitting to him, if we're, if we're engaging in self-will, we could do some really bad things. And we need to be careful. As soon as Moses arrived at the well, in a natural way, he began to serve. Just like the deliverer he wanted to be, only on a smaller scale, and not for the people that he wanted to deliver, but he just started serving where he was, in a small, simple way. If we ignore God's word, and the means for understanding and applying His Word. And by that I mean Bible reading, Lord's Day services, wise counselors. And by wise counselors, children, I mean parents and pastors. Talk to a lot of people who like to go out and say, Oh, I've got all kinds of counselors. Are your parents one of them? Well, no, I haven't talked to them about this. They ought to be first. Unless they're ungodly people, they ought to be first on the list. Well, have you talked to your pastor about that? Well, no, no, no. Did you commit yourself to this church? And has this church recognized certain people with a measure of gift and grace? Well, then maybe you ought to think about who you're talking to. Don't just tell me you've got your counselors. You may just be, was it Jeroboam? Went out and talked to all of his friends just like him in his age. Oh, I've got all kinds of counselors. Yes. We need to be using the means, recognizing that if we continue in our way of self-will and our way of pride, we could do some very terrible things. Third lesson, God is capable of working for us and in us in spite of us. God's going to accomplish his purposes. It's all of grace. Paul was what he was by the grace of God. Moses was what he was by the grace of God. So if we fail... We need to repent of our sins. We need to turn from our sins and turn back to Christ and let God accomplish his purposes in the way that he sees fit. He may be doing it with a different instrument. He may be preparing you for something else. Fourth way that God teaches us or, or prepares his servants is through rejection. This is very patent on the, the life of Moses or very patent in the life of Moses. It's patent in a lot of the servants of Christ. Joseph, rejected by his family, mistreated by Potiphar's household, forgotten in prison. Moses, rejected by his brethren, those for whom he left the palace in order that he might save them were the ones who rejected them. Didn't they know what I gave up for them? Obviously not. Or if they did, they didn't care. He was misunderstood and driven out for, of fear for his life to leave his countrymen. But brethren, when we talk about rejection and realizing that God uses rejection to form his servants, there's no greater example of that than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Even God's own son faced rejection. It was prophesied of him in Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted for, with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and he was not esteem we did not esteem him. He came into his own created order, which he himself had brought about, and his own people did not receive him. Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own home. Because that's what he experienced. He was rejected by his hometown. He was rejected by his creatures. He was rejected as a man of sorrows, one that was not to be looked upon. His disciples misunderstood him. Peter rebuked him. Peter denied him. His disciples de left him and deserted him. He knew what it was to be rejected. They spat upon him. They mocked him. Read through those accounts. And see what our Savior suffered. And how He suffered such humiliation being rejected by those whom He gave up so much to come and to save. 
to live among sinful men and to die for men who were sinners. They put a purple robe on him and mocked him as a king and put a crown of thorns on his head and beat him with a scepter that they had made for him. Despised and rejected. And as he hung upon the cross, it only got worse. Hurling abuse at him, the chief priests and scribes mocking him, the robbers hanging on either side of him, joining into the chorus. And all of this, at least in part because although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. He was being shaped into the servant that he was to be to fulfill his role as the God-man, the redeemer for us, for mankind. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted because he knew what it was to face these things. He had personal resources, if you will, experiences within his own human body. To be sympathetic, high priest, who could know what you're going through. This is the way God shapes his servants. Pastor Smith prayed that God would raise up young men to be pastors, to go out into the ends of the earth. You want to go through the course? You want to be put through God's shaping machine? Through the providences, through the failures, through the rejection, through the pain and through the agony, at times the darkness, in order to be a faithful servant? It better be a calling. And you better not run unless you're called. Because you, nor I, could handle it without him. Come back to Moses. As we've learned these lessons from Moses, this is God's Redeemer. Here is the servant of God, select and chosen and prepared to lead his people. A baby born to a poor family. A baby in danger of losing his life from the day that he was born. A man who is misunderstood and rejected by his own countrymen. A man who was an alien in a foreign land. A man who had a lowly job and served others. This is God's shepherd. This was God's servant. This was God's mediator. This was God's lawgiver and judge. This is God's redeemer. If you were an Israelite, and you were under this oppression that we looked at in chapter 1 and sought to really grasp the pain and agony that those people were under, and you were there feeling the lashes and the rods on your own back, and you went through or going through having to make bricks without straw at some point, and every time you turned around, you were being despised by the Egyptians. And the little Egyptian children made faces at you and made fun of you. Oh, you're just a slave. And you were put under that kind of pain and agony day after day after day after day after day without vacation, without sick leave, without help. And somebody came along and said, you know what? My name's Moses. And God has called me while I was out in the wilderness. I've met him face to face. And now I'm here. And let me show you. And he puts his hand in. And out comes a leprous hand. And he puts it back and it comes out clean. And he throws down the rod and it becomes a snake. And he picks it up and it's a rod again. He says his name is I Am. And he sent me to save you. 
I wouldn't be, I'd be surprised that not every one of you wouldn't just jump up and say, man, sign me up. I am ready to go. Get me out of this place. Which way, Moses? Deliver me from this oppression and agony which is burdening my soul. Jesus, the Son of God, infinite in all His adorable perfections, came to this world for our deliverance. He didn't leave the palace of Pharaoh. He left the palace of heaven. He didn't leave the glory of a palace, an earthly palace. He left the glory of the side of His heavenly Father and He condescended and became a man. And He dwelt among men a life of sorrow from the day that He was born. And He lived being despised and rejected. And that despising and that rejection intensified every day as He went along until the end when He came to the cross. And even as He was there humiliated on the cross, they kept heaping it on Him. And He did all of that to deliver people from a bondage greater than any taskmaster in Egypt could ever put upon you. More than any Pharaoh could have ever pressed an Israelite slave with. He came to deliver you from your sin. And He came to deliver you from the judgment and wrath of God. He came to redeem, to deliver, to lead you out. To set you free. And you can feel more for the slave than you can for your own soul. You'd line up behind Moses who would only deliver you from a time to give you into other difficulties. You'd line up behind him, but you won't come to Jesus Christ to be set free from an even greater danger and greater burden. Think about it. Think about what you are willing to give up. Think about who you are rejecting, entering into the rejection of somebody infinitely compassionate, amazingly self-denying, exemplary in his self-denial, boundless in his love. Meditate on it. Think about it. Contemplate the decision. Contemplate the place that you are presently sitting. And run to Jesus Christ. Don't sit there in your apathy and think, ah, no big deal. God may knock the pride out of you when Jesus Christ comes. And forever in your angry pride, you will clench your teeth and clasp your fists in a place where fire never ends. And there's no rest. He came to set you free. If you can appreciate Moses, appreciate Jesus Christ much more. Let's pray. Our Father, we are a soft generation. Our hearts despise the hard and the difficult. Oftentimes we don't want to face your shaping influences because of the pain associated with them. Forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for our folly. Help us to submit graciously to your wise directing and shaping of us to be your servants. We plead with you, O God, that you would use us for the glory of your name, in whatever capacity you might choose. 
We ask, Lord, that you would bless your word, that you would guide and direct us, help us to embrace your leading. We pray all this in the name of our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.